we don't have something to distinguish ourselves from the bad, if we don't have something that sets us apart, because remember, the church is called the ecclesia. That's the word that's translated to church in the New Testament. It means the called out. We're not supposed to be of this world. I mean, yeah, the average person in the world, you throw a brick through their window, they're going to pick it up and throw it right back at you. Yes, that, that is how the world functions. Christians aren't supposed to be like that. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. The Chaplain's Report today is going to come from the Book of Romans. We're going to temporarily suspend our series on 1 Samuel. We'll probably pick it up next week. I'm just, you know, trying to to get a feel for all this, and I think that today we, we needed something that kind of directly pertains to what we've been talking about. We really need some Bible today, and that's why we're going to dive straight into it. So let's go ahead and look at Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 13. Paul writes here, Love must be free from hypocrisy. Detest what is evil, cling to that which is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. The opening part of that verse, the part where Paul is saying that love needs to be free from hypocrisy, I mean, that's what we were just talking about. For love to be free from hypocrisy, it has to be impartial. You have to extend love and extend grace and extend compassion to those you disagree with. You have to be willing to do the right thing and to treat people well, to treat people like Christ, even when that person doesn't deserve it, because that's how we were treated when Christ first came to us. We were broken, we were sinners in need of a Savior. And had he treated us like we deserved, he wouldn't have died for our sins. We are here today, we have a chance at salvation, because Jesus treated us like we didn't deserve. He treated us better than we deserved. I get that what's going on in the country right now, there are people that will pick up a, a skateboard or a brick and hurl it through a window, and I get that the natural reaction to that is to find that same brick and hurl it through their window at their house. But that's not the right way to handle it. That's what it means to love without hypocrisy. That your love isn't partial. That you treat that person just like you would your own brother or your own mother or your own father or your savior. It's the only correct response. That even when they treat you horribly, you love them. That's what Jesus called us to do, and that's what Paul is reiterating to the Christians there at Rome. And he gives a little bit of guidance there in the very next sentence where he says, Detest that which is evil, and cling to that which is good. See, I'm really glad that he pointed that out, because I think that there are a lot of Christians who mean well. But normally what happens is we kind of think that as long as we're not sinning or doing bad things, that we're, we're kind of good in God's sight. That, that we're doing what we're supposed to do. Are we called to not sin or are we called to be light and salt to the world? Now certainly, part of the reason that we don't need to sin is because that will prevent us from being that light and salt in the world. But do we really think that God will be pleased with us if our big accomplishment in life is, Hey, I didn't sin! Okay, good. What did you do for the kingdom? It's good that you didn't sin. It's good that you were saved and, and you found forgiveness of your sins and you tried to refrain from sin from then on. But 
that's not what we're called to do. We have to detest evil, stand against it, hate it. It's the one thing that we are supposed to hate. And we're supposed to cling to that which is good. So it's not enough to just not engage in evil. We have to be the opponents of evil. To fight it. To stand against it. It's not enough just to not like evil. We have to abhor it and do everything we can to keep as little of it as possible in this world. To snuff it out at every turn when possible. But then there's the second part of that, which is cling to that which is good. You see, it would be, I guess, theoretically possible to just abstain from sin without doing the good things that we're talking about, the, the things that God commands us to do, you know, to love our neighbor and to, to help people out and to spread the gospel and, and to do his will, so on and so forth. I guess it would be theoretically possible to do that, but realistically, there's not a human being in this world that could just stop sinning but not do all the good stuff that is commanded. First of all, because that's kind of a sin of omission anyway, but secondly, because that good stuff is going to keep us from being engaged in the bad. It's so easy to backslide when we're not busy about doing the Father's work. A great example is David with Bathsheba. You know, when it's talking about how he looked at her, did you know that the context of that looking at her and seeing Bathsheba and starting to lust after her and want her to the point to where he eventually murdered her husband so that he could have her? Do you know how that started? David was supposed to be in the field of battle, and he wasn't. David had a responsibility as the king of Israel to be out in the field of battle by that point in time, but he decided to just hang around the house and let his generals handle that for a little bit. I'm going to take some R&R. &R. And in limited doses, that's fine. But David was not abhorring evil the way that he should have, partly because he was not doing the good that he was ordered to do. And Christians very often find ourselves in this trap. We neglect to do the good, and because of that, we are not adequately equipped to stave off the evil. And what has happened in the Capitol today is, I think, there are some people there in that crowd that neglected to do the good, and because of that, that temptation came and the evil was just too enticing for them because they didn't adequately abhor the evil because they had not been clinging to the good. I think that that's a pretty apt synopsis of what happened the other day. I don't know them, I don't know their hearts, but I do understand human nature. And if I had to take a stab in the dark, I don't think I would be far off in saying that that is a good synopsis of, of what took place the other day. And ultimately that is because the good is what drives out the evil. It's doing things like following the golden rule and trying to bring other people to Christ, to show love for them, to be engaged in benevolence, to feed the sheep, as Jesus put it. Because when we're doing that, everything else just kind of falls into place. When we're doing the things that God asked us to do, if we are busy about trying to engage in work that benefits God's kingdom, there's just not a lot of time left to sin. And beyond that, there's just not a lot of desire to. You know, if you are engaged in the things that you are supposed to be doing, for example, we'll just use the example of a marriage. Whenever cheating happens, it's almost always because somebody in the marriage, or both people in the marriage, more often than not, are engaging or are neglecting to do the things that God asks a man and a woman to do. To fulfill each other, to protect each other, to look out for one another, to support one another, for the man to, to lead and for the woman to love and to, to nourish and to take care of. Usually when that system starts breaking down, the sin happens, but the sin is an outcropping of a lack of doing something good. And that's just the way that it works. And that's just a small example of, of how it works in our lives. Normally, if we're engaged in whatever sin it is, whether it's we have a problem controlling our anger, or we have an issue with gossiping, or we have problems with you know sexual desires, or almost always, not always, but most of the time, those are outcroppings of us neglecting to do what God asks us to do. That's the underlying problem. 
And so ultimately, I think that that's something that we need here. It goes back to really what I was saying in the last segment, which is if we don't have something to distinguish ourselves from the bad, if we don't have something that sets us apart, because remember, the church is called the ecclesia. That's the word that's translated to church in the New Testament. It means the called out. We're not supposed to be of this world. I mean, yeah, the average person in the world, you throw a brick through their window, they're going to pick it up and throw it right back at you. Yes, that, that is how the world functions. Christians aren't supposed to be like that. I, I get that it's hard. I get that it's frustrating to watch the media and law enforcement and people on the left offer excuse after excuse to watch people riot and burn down our cities and our towns and not do a dang thing about it, and they have neglected their duty, and they will have to answer to God for that one day. But that does not excuse us doing the same thing and turning into them. It just doesn't. That is not made okay because other people are doing bad things. Two wrongs do not make a right. And ultimately, if we remember that, I think it'll go a long way in helping us to remember to do the right thing as well. By abhorring the evil, by calling it out for what it is, by calling a spade a spade and calling it out even when it hurts, even when it's somebody from our side, we are doing our part in abhorring the evil and clinging to the good. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.